She battled towering waves alone at sea. Her bravery and success have won her hero status, but now retired from sailing, she's still not one to shy away from a challenge. Welcome to the Global Conversation, where we're here in the Isle of Wight in England. And I'm joined by Ellen MacArthur, who's become somewhat of a living legend in the sailing world. Ellen MacArthur, many thanks for being with us on the programme. So you ditched sailing and you are now dedicating your life, you're championing the cause of the circular economy, trying to engender a systemic shift in the way the global economy works in order to manage our resources better. But what made you think you would be able to do this, that you could be one of the drivers of change? Well, to begin with, I had no idea what abilities were needed. And in fact, when you say I, I ditched sailing, it didn't really feel like that to me, really. It didn't even feel like I, I, I retired. I, it was at the height of your career, though. I'd just broken the round the world record. And actually, that, in a way, was the, was the segue into what I'm doing today. Because without looking for it, I found something quite fundamental. And that was that when you sail around the world on a boat, you take with you everything you need. You're at sea for three months. You have to take everything before you go, because you can't stop. You can't buy more fuel or food. And so you manage everything you have on that boat down to the last drop of diesel and the last packet of food. And you realize what finite really means, because what you have is all you have. There, there simply is no more. And I stepped off the boat at the finish line, and I suddenly realized that, in fact, our global economy is no different. Our global economy is entirely dependent on finite resources, yet our solution is just efficiency. Our solution is to be more careful with the use of resources. But when you start to pan that out, when you start to look at the long-term economic impact of that, actually, you know, what, what does the solution look like? To me, that, that wasn't a solution. So, so give me an example of how one would live one's life via the principles of the circular economy. Well, the circular economy is much more about a change in a system. It's not at all about individual behaviour change. The circular economy is looking at our current economic model as a linear one, saying that we take something out of the ground, we make something out of it, and then ultimately we throw it away, and we get what we can out at the end, we recycle what we can. With a circular economy, from the beginning, you design for disassembly, you design for remanufacture, you design so that that product can fit within a flow. It could be parts of a car or a car okay. itself. Okay, well, give, yeah, give me an example, day-to-day -day life. A uh, day-to-day life could be a washing machine. With a washing machine, you would probably paper wash rather than buy the machine itself because if you analyse what we actually pay, we pay tax when we buy a washing machine, we pay tax when we throw it away through landfill tax. Uh, so there's two taxes to be paid and we buy all the materials, all the metals, all the polymers within that washing machine when we buy it. It's not designed to last forever, of course, because that's how the economic model works. Selling the linear economy is what's important for businesses to make profit. So actually it's a good thing if it breaks in theory because then businesses can sell more, we can have more jobs, we can make more machines and that's how the So you must have business against you though, big businesses against you and something like this. Well, when we looked at the economics, and this was interesting because we, when we went to our initial global partners, and we founded the foundation, it was with this idea that if you could cycle materials, both technical and biological, you could build a regenerative, restorative economy. That was what does that basic, mean? <laughs> just the basic principle. That means that you design for disassembly, you design for remanufacture, you design a technical product that has metals, plastics, polymers within it, so that its materials can be recovered, but not just its materials, the product itself can be recovered. It can be resold, remanufactured, regenerated, decomponentized, and as much of the value as possible, and the most value lies in the product as a whole, can go back into the system. Every economic report that we've looked at so far, and we've questioned them before because we haven't known the economics, has come up with an economic benefit to the circular economy. How does it work then at an international level? Because I can see it works at a national level, but at an international level when we're dealing with massive ex exports, for example, from China, how on earth can you apply that? Well, you could take one example of the remanufacturing of Renault engines. So, you know, Renault is it's an international company. Um, it works all over the world. From Europe, which is still international, it's not intercontinental at the moment, they certainly have international operations, they collect engines, gearboxes and fuel pumps from the entire Renault network right through Europe. They ship them into a plant just outside Paris where they remanufacture them, they strip them down, they ultrasonically clean them, they reassemble them with primarily uh, 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 remanufactured parts, some new parts. They go out the door with the same warranty as a new engine for significantly less than a new engine by cost and Renault makes more profit on that than on a new engine. In fact, that plant is Renault's most profitable plant in the world. And that shows that you can, you can change the system you can do that if on an international basis, and yet it benefits us as the user and it benefits the manufacturer. So we've asked our online audience to send in questions, and they've all been quite intrigued by this. And we received a question from someone called Selgsi, and he asks, or she asks, what motivates you? 
What motivates me? Crikey, that's a very broad question. Um, I guess I'm motivated by goals. And, you know, I sailed around the world for many years. It was my career. I never, ever thought that I would stop it. Not for a second. I thought I'd be sailing around the world until I was 80 years old. But when I came across this, this seemed like the greatest challenge I'd ever seen. The global economy didn't work. I couldn't, I couldn't actually get my head around the fact that I'd suddenly realised that, that I'd never thought of that before. So I guess what motivates me is, is making a difference, is doing something positive, is a goal. And actually, if you can lump those three in together, then that's the, the ideal challenge, really. Is giving up an option? Giving up's never been an option for me. <laughs> Not at all. Not when there's something so important. You know, we, we fundamentally know that the way our economy works today cannot run in the long term. That's unquestionable, which, based on finite resources, running through a linear system. Linear is a straight line, things fall off the end. We have to change the way that our economy functions, that's for sure. What are the stumbling blocks? It's a systems level change and I think, you know, we work with a lot of businesses around circular economy principles and I think one of the biggest challenges is, this is not a design challenge, that's one element, but it's an entire systems level change across the business. So it's design, it's marketing, it's innovation, it's, it's looking at the finance department. So actually there's not a part of the business that it doesn't touch. It's 100% positive, you'd say. There are no negatives to this. You can't say there's no negatives. One of the challenges is that it's a systemic change, so it touches every part of the economy. So it's very hard to know where to start within a business, within the European Commission, if you're looking at legislation. Actually, where, where do you start? Because we're talking about changing every element of the economy. So it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. That, I would say, is one of the, the biggest negatives, is that actually you can't just tackle one part. There's no specific little part that you start at. Start at. You mentioned the European... Commission. The European Commission has now just recently made its own proposals in terms of the circular economy. They're mostly based on recycling and a ban on landfills. Well, what do you make of it? I think one of the most interesting elements of the European Commission's work around the circular economy is the fact that they're looking at taking, for example, the Eco -di Design Directive, which was very much focused on the energy consumption of products, and saying how do we take that further to look at what sits within products, the recyclability of products, of course, but actually that lies within the fact that the products are designed to be recycled, they're designed to be regenerated, they're designed to be remanufactured. So it's opening up much more to look at the whole system rather than just the energy element. Does it go far enough? Well, far enough would be a circular economy in its entirety, and that's going to take time. And you know, we are we're putting case studies forward. There's a lot of activity going on within the circular economic space. However, we're at the beginning, and we're all learning. We don't have all the answers at this stage, so we will learn and we will take it far enough. But this is just the beginning at this stage. What's your timeline on this? Is there a timeline? I mean, the timeline effectively has to be as, as soon as possible. We have targets in each of our individual programmes. We have targets that we work on with our businesses that we work with. As an overall target as to when the, the, the economy can be 100% circular, it will never be because you always have entropy, you always have the loss of materials, but it's about moving in a direction. And I guess it, it, it reminds me of me as a child. I was four years old and I sailed. And as that four-year-old child, sailing was the greatest sense of freedom I could imagine. And I decided there and then that one day I would sail around the world. I had no idea how it would happen. I had no idea when it would happen. But I knew that I would do my absolute utmost to take every single step to get me closer to that goal. And it did happen. And I felt very much when I came across the ideas of a circular economy that same feeling. This is something to aim for. We won't get there tomorrow. We're not going to get there in 10 or 20 years. But it gives a direction of travel that works towards a, a greater goal. So how much of your life are you able to lead now according to these principles? Is it possible at all? Um, one of the questions I asked myself when I first be became aware of the fact that resources were finite was if I changed everything in my life in the best way that I could today so that you know, I had um, a, a style of living that could continue in the long term, I couldn't. Yeah. There's many things you could do, but the system didn't function. The system itself within which we live didn't function in a way that could run in the long term. And so I'm very much interested in the big picture. You know, when you, when you race a boat around the world, you're, you're managing the boat, you're managing the energy of the boat, you're managing everything on the boat, but you also you sit within this bigger weather system. You're always looking at the big picture. And for me, it was the big picture. The circle economy is the big picture. That was what was absolutely fascinating. So how does the adrenaline compare to what you're doing now as to when you were sailing? Um, there's a lot of adre adrenaline in both worlds, <laughs> I have to say. How does that adrenaline compare? When you sail around the world, there is massive adrenaline. You know, you fear for your life. But actually, ultimately, it doesn't really matter. If it all goes wrong, it's just you. It's your family, it's the implications on your family and friends, but it's just you. It doesn't really matter. And you do it for you because that's your goal. This isn't for me. This is something much larger. This is 
a massive challenge for all of us moving forward. So if there's a reason for adrenaline to be higher in this, it's because actually, you know, this, this, this really matters. Our global economy really matters. So we received this question from someone who goes by the name of Titusen, who asks, what was your greatest fear being a sailor? And I'd like to add, what's your greatest fear now? My greatest fear as a sailor was failure. And my greatest fear now is failure. So there's just no option that this is not going to work. It's, it's, you know, this is the most important thing I've ever done, without a, any question. And you're trying to inspire younger generations as well, because they'll be the ones taking this on and living their lives by this model. Are the are younger generations willing to innovate in this way? Can, are they, can they see where you're going more clearly, for example, than a business leader? Young people love this. You know, we've worked in education um, here in the UK. We now work globally as we've built that up since the foundation started. We've got some amazing stories. There was a student from the UK who was doing his A-level, so he was 18 years old, and he went to his design and technology teacher, and they'd been studying circular economy, they'd been working with the foundation, and he said, Sir, when I did my GCSEs, age 16, I loved D&T, but I couldn't think of anything to design. But now, now I've learned about the circular economy, everything I see I want to redesign. He saw a world of opportunity, and we see this again and again. And innovation also kind of, also means a certain amount of adventure. And we often hear that we, that, you know, young people have lost their spirit of adventure. What's your take? I think life's about the journey, not the destination. And I think there's a great truth in that word adventure in what we're undertaking through the circular economy. It's about innovation, it's about creativity, it's about a total systems level change. How awesome, how amazing there's something to aim for. We see that, we see the lights in the eyes of students and within businesses and within regions. This is something to aim for. The recognition you've gained thanks to sailing has allowed you to do this. Do you enjoy the trappings of fame and celebrity? I've never been someone who's enjoyed the trappings of fame and celebrity. <laughs> I've been someone who's been extremely grateful for the support and you know the warmth of the welcome home when you finish around the world is amazing absolutely amazing but I wouldn't put that in the fame and celebrity box I'd put that in the warmth of human nature box because it's quite extraordinary but those moments are not real life there is real life out there and that's how I deal with them if you were to define and I'm putting you on the spot slightly here but one of the resounding highs of your career now be the sailing or now working with the circular economy what would it be and what would be the low the high I always believe is in front of me. It hasn't happened yet. Because I think it's really important to have that thing that you're moving towards in your life. And actually, funny enough, I was asked exactly that question at the finish of the second round of the world when I broke the record. Is this the greatest moment of your life? And I said, I'm sure it's still to come, but it's not a bad one. Um, and the lows, <sighs> there have been many lows. I mean, there are lows in life when you can't find funding for the foundation. You know, we've had when we first set out, we didn't even know what the foundation was going to do. We didn't, hadn't even come across the circular economy. We could see this massive challenge and we couldn't grasp what the solution could look like. That was a low. Equally a low is almost dying in the Southern Ocean. But almost, there's less frustration in the almost dying in the Southern Ocean because it happens like that. One minute you're nearly dead and the next minute you're still alive and it's kind of over. This was different. This was a real journey. And then I'd like to end with this question from someone called Mohammed Uber, who says... What's the secret of your success? And I assume he doesn't want to kill you off too soon, but he says, how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> so what's the secret of success? Your success. My success. Determination. What makes you so determined? I've absolutely no idea why I'm so determined, but I have always been, and I'm selectively competitive and determined, but there's certain things that I just, I lock onto and like the round the world, somehow making that happen, down to saving my school dinner money change when I was a child because I didn't get pocket money and eventually saving up for a boat and then eventually doing one up and sailing around Britain. It was all a journey, but it was having the focus on that goal. So I would say determination. And what would I like to be remembered for? Just being a nice person. Ellen MacArthur, many thanks for being with us on The Global Conversation. Thank you very much.